bigger issue there is really, of course, he didn't know what he was doing because who does? Right. Michael's an air traffic controller. He's not a lawyer. And yes, he is naive. And he figures, well, you go to court, you get your day in court. Uh, I'll tell my side. And of course, the scales of justice and all of that. Yeah, they'll no. do the right thing. Yeah. No, the court continually rules in favor of someone who's committing crimes, who's yeah. abducted a child. He's always behind. And so the right. idea that he's a babe in the woods with the courts and that he makes tremendous mistakes legally and that his lawyer makes mistakes and he doesn't know it, of course, because guess what? That happens to millions of people all right. the time. Right. Okay. And the family court system, not just in the United States, but around the world, the more I've read about it, it just eats people up. And we talk so much about the mothers and the fathers, but it's the children. I mean, they get eaten up. And virtually every state in this country has a slogan in family court. It's called the best interest of the child. But it's never about the best interest of the child. Hey, this is Diane Dirks. And I'm Rick Voiles. We've been working with co-parents in conflict for more than two decades. We've taught classes, written books, counseled parents, empathized and agonized a few times to help people make sense of their complicated families. We were talking one day and it occurred to us that helping the most difficult cases comes down to one simple concept. Is one parent willing to let go of the tug of war rope or is it worth it to hold on and fight? So we invite you to take this journey with us each episode as we tackle the questions, should you hold on or let it go? Hey, listeners, many of you have inquired about online co-parent coaching. Diane and I don't have the time ourselves to provide that service, but the organization we both work for does. The Center for Navigating Family Change will be launching its online coaching program, under our training and direction this fall. We think our CNFC coaches are going to be swamped with requests, so we want to give our Co-Parent Dilemma listeners first dips. Just go to the link in our show notes to complete the pre-registration form that will push you to the front of the line. There's no obligation, and you'll get information about how it will work so that you can decide. It's time to take advantage of having your own personal co-parent coach to help you respond to your difficult co-parent. Welcome to Co-Parent Dilemmas, where we give you practical solutions to those impossible co-parents. Hello, Diane. Hello. How are you doing? I'm in my British voice again. <laughs> well, practice makes no, I'm perfect. Not. <laughs> I'm doing okay. Well, um, yeah. yeah. It's September, so it's, you know, a month of change. So, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. quite a bit. And I... very busy. I'm going on a cruise at the end of the month. Whoa. With my sister, who has a granddaughter who's three, and her, my sister's daughter, who's my niece, are you following? Um, <laughs> she and her husband are going on a cruise and taking the child, and my sister was supposed to go on the cruise to babysit the child while they had fun. And then when they want the child, she'll have fun. So she invited me and said, I don't want to have fun alone. So will you come? So it's two grandmas babysitting Whoa. a three-year-old. And then when the three-year-old's with their parents, it's two grandmas partying. Ooh. So. <laughs> Is it a Disney cruise? <laughs> no. <thank God. laughs> yeah. Actually, we're going to Bermuda. Nice. And I've never told this story before, but I went to Bermuda, oh gosh, maybe 20 years ago, but I only saw it from a plane because Bermuda is a very long, skinny island. Mm -hmm. And Bill, you know this, they can only land a certain way. And if there's too difficult of a crosswind, they can't land. So my husband and I were about to land and then they would pull up and then they would circle around and then they'd try it again. And I think we tried three times and they finally said... Sorry, we're not going to Bermuda today. And they took us back to Atlanta. No. <laughs> and, uh, and because we were only going for like a three-day trip, we ended up canceling the trip because it didn't make sense to try again tomorrow because there was uh, only at the time one flight to Bermuda out every day from Atlanta. So anyway, so when she told me they were going on a cruise to Bermuda, I'm like, oh, I'm in because I've never actually got there. That's that's called a go around. And yes. uh, if you do it too often, you're going to burn up a lot of fuel. But I thought yeah. you were going to say you went to another nearby island. And oh. actually, there aren't too many that are near Bermuda. The way you no. look at the map, it's sort of all by itself out there. 
So, so I was thinking maybe the Bermuda Triangle is really a thing and we were going to get Ooh, like sucked into it. Yes. Anyway, before before we get any further in, welcome, Bill. It is Hi, Bill, Bill, right? We, or do we call Hi. you William? No, uh, you know, if you're looking to see my work online, it's William J. McGee. That's my byline. Um, okay. But um, I go by Bill, so happy to respond well, to Bill. Now that you've heard Bill's voice, we need to introduce him. <laughs> We're <laughs> glad to welcome Bill McGee, who's the author of the novel Half the Child. And since we are in September, the month of talking about parental alienation, it wouldn't be right to talk about it without having an author of a novel, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> because the author has talked about alienation in a very poignant way from a alienated parent's point of view. And our goal, Bill, just so you know, with this uh, month of talking about alienation was to talk about it from a different point of view than people usually hear. Um, typically, we would have Maybe some professionals come on, an attorney, you know, people talk about it from the up above perspective, blah, blah, blah. And it wouldn't really, to me, have much uh, authenticity. I really wanted to hear from the people that have experienced it. Um, I would love to have the alienating parents point of view. But I don't think they'd agree to do it, do you? <laughs> that would be a hard interview. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm not going to reveal yet who we're going to have in the next two uh, episodes, but we'll be talking about that on social media. So uh, keep your eyes and ears towards our social media to find out. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce Bill. And Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you have a background in av aviation, which I think our listeners would find fascinating as well so sure well thank you so much uh diane rick I'm, I'm really happy to be here and i appreciate you giving me the forum to talk about this uh yes i do have a, a background in aviation i've published two books and uh they're very different books one is nonfiction, one is fiction the nonfiction one is called attention all passengers and it has to do with airline safety it's an expose on the airline industry mostly on safety issues um, and then half the child is a novel it's fiction and that has to do with um, parental alienation, custody, and abduction, parental abduction. And um, when I was writing Half the Child, I was trying to decide uh, what to give my narrator, the protagonist of the story, Michael Mullen, what to give him for a career, you know, because other than the book of Job, this poor guy goes through just about the worst experience you can imagine. Everything in his life falls apart because of his uh, wife asking for separation and then divorce and then a custody situation. And ultimately, his ex-wife abducts his young son. And so, um, Michael, his life just falls apart in his quest to keep his young son, Ben, and, his, and, and him together. And uh, it affects his physical health, his mental health, his friendships, his romance, everything. His, certainly his finances. And... Um, I'm trying to decide what to give him for a career. And I, at first I had him working in sales. And then I realized, you know what, let's give him a nice, quiet, steady, unstressful job. So I made him an air traffic controller at LaGuardia <laughs> Airport. Um, and uh, right. this poor guy, you know, and, and that actually, I mean, it is not an aviation book. I want to make that clear for those that are <laughs> aviation geeks like myself. But there are a lot of scenes that take place up in the tower at LaGuardia or La Garbage, as he calls the airport. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Michael, when the book starts and when the novel starts, Michael is a, an air traffic controller. He's a professional. He prides himself on being able to block everything out and just focusing on the job at hand. And for the first time in his life, he was a military controller and now a civilian controller. First time in his life, his, his life is creeping into his work. And I won't give it away, but there's one rather dramatic scene where uh, he is so stressed out about Ben, who is missing and he doesn't know where Ben is that it bleeds into his work. And I don't have to tell you um, that that's life and death work. So, yeah, so I, I managed to, you know, to, uh, to to move through a couple of different worlds. My day job is I'm an advocate for you and you and everyone else out there. I'm an advocate for airline passengers. I work for a nonprofit in Washington and we advocate on behalf of passengers for consumer rights and safety and issues like that, competition but uh, I'm also a writer, a teacher, a journalist. I, I do a lot of things. And Half the Child is very close to my heart. It's uh, It was truly a labor of love. It was something I worked on for many years. I put it aside and go back to it. Um, but um, 
I'm, I'm so happy that it is so well received in the community of people that have experienced similar things. And, you know, most times when you publish a book, the journey sort of ends there. But in my case, I think in many ways it began because I've just met so many people who can relate to it. Um, and I also want to stress this. I think it's very important because I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about gender. There's parental alienation and these issues with custody and abduction, they cross gender lines. This is not this is not men versus women or women versus men. Um, there are fathers that are victims. There are mothers that are victims. There are sons that are victims. There are you know daughters that are victims. And in this case, I wrote about a father and his son, but it could easily have been a mother and a daughter. But it's been very encouraging for me to hear from people who have been through similar experiences. I think there's a sense in this world that you think you're the only person that has undergone something like this. There's one line in the in the novel that I quote very often. Uh, Michael is just feeling so alienated, even though he has a very strong network. He has family and he has friends that do support him and do care about him. They, they save his life, really. He wouldn't be able to survive without them. But at one point, he says, nobody truly gets it. And I think that's a sense that you get sometimes. And the line that he says is, I feel like I'm a demographic of one. You know, and I think we all feel like we're a demographic of one. No matter how close you are to someone, no matter how much they care about you, they truly can't fully understand what you're going through. And um, so it's great to hear from others who say, yes, I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. So how much of the book mirrors your own personal experiences? Well, I'm, I'm intimately familiar with these topics. I made a decision early on that I wanted to write a novel because I wanted to create a fictional world to tell this story. Um, I have one child. I'm very close to him. And um, I had no desire to ever write a memoir about such events. Fiction allows you to do a lot of things. I'm also a creative writing professor. I teach fiction and nonfiction. And I write both fiction and nonfiction. And what I'm always saying to my students is, you know, um, think about the choices you make. And sometimes nonfiction is the way to go, as with my expose on the airline industries. And sometimes fiction is a better choice because what I did with this novel, I wrote it in first person. It's told from Michael's perspective. And so, you know, any writing teacher will tell you that limits the perspective as opposed to third person where you have an omniscient or godlike view. We're inside Michael's head. And that's what I wanted. I wanted the reader to be inside his head. That's why I also made it in present tense. So he says, I see, not I saw. He has no perspective. That's why I made it present tense. I didn't want to write a book that was five or 10 years later after his experience, where now he's wiser and he knows more. I wanted him to experience it as it happens. Um, my agent, who was attempting to sell the book several years ago, he asked me, well, how would you sum it up? And I said, well, it's really like a 361-page car accident in slow motion. Michael mm. is always reactive. He's he's never the one initiating the action. It always comes from the other side. And he's always responding. And he's always a day late. And he's always, you know, trying to catch up. And um, because of that, his son suffers greatly and he suffers greatly. I could really relate to Mike in the book, not from my personal experience, but from my professional experience in walking the journey with an alienated parent or hearing their stories, maybe not. By the time they got to me, a lot of their story was behind them. But this fact that Michael seemed naive and trusting in the beginning, especially of the court system, you know, we'll, mm. we'll go to court and it'll work out. And then something happens that he realizes they're going to let her move to what, Indiana. And then and then something else happens. And, oh, they're going to let that happen. Okay. And it's almost like the the frog in the water where the ambient temperature goes up and up and up till finally he realizes, I'm cooked. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's I mean, this Melbourne. slow yeah. sort of process. And then all of a sudden, he wakes up one day and he's lost it all. Yes. And is wondering, what just happened to me in these last few years? And right. so I thought that was a very realistic way. I love that you said I'm, I wanted it to be in the present tense because you really get that sense of it's not really his growth, it's his enlightenment in a right. very negative kind of sense. Right, right. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, in all of these situations, there's always someone that says to you, well, anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger and wiser. 
And someone says that to him when he's at his absolute lowest point. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I would much prefer to be weaker and stupider. Thank you. <laughs> right. Keep you know. all your pain. Can you I know? punch you in the face now? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, right. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, yes. So um, when you're in that reactive mode, you know, I, I have a website, halfthechild.com, and there's an email function on there. So if anyone wants to contact me, good, bad, comments, questions, whatever, I'm always happy to talk to readers. And one reader contacted me about a year after the book came out. And she was very critical. And she said, Mr. McGee, I think you made a lot of mistakes with this book. And I said, well, please tell me more. I'm very eager to mm -hmm. learn more. And she wrote me a very long email. And she named about 20 things that Michael did wrong legally in the courts and that his lawyer did <laughs> oh. wrong. Okay. So my first question was, can I ask you something? Do you work in the legal profession? And she said, yes, yeah. I'm a paralegal. We deal with custody. So I kind of thought so. You know, she was <laughs> right. saying, well, he should have done an order to show cause and they should have filed this and they should have asked for a change of venue. Well, of course, but. And that, I but... said, yeah, right, thank you. You're, you're going to say what I'm going to say there. Um, <laughs> and, but I mean, but, you know, the bigger issue there is really, of course, he didn't know what he was doing because who does? Right. I mean, who among us falls in love, as Michael did, thinks that you're marrying a partner for life, that you're going to die in each other's arms, that you're going to bring a child into the world and you're going to live happily ever after? Who among us then thinks the absolute worst and think, you know, Michael, when the novel opens, they're separated. They haven't yet divorced. And Michael is still hopeful that they'll get back together. It's a faint hope, but he's saying, well, yes. maybe let's go to, you know, let's go to therapy. Let's do what we can. Let's get back together. Every, he's always behind. And so the right. idea that he's a babe in the woods with the courts and that he makes tremendous mistakes legally and that his lawyer makes mistakes and he doesn't know it. Of course, because guess what? That happens to millions of people all right. the time. Right. Okay. And yep. and the family court system, not just in the United States, but around the world, the more I've, I've read about it, it just eats people up. And, yeah. you know, we talk so much about the mothers and the fathers, but it's the children. I mean, they, they're just, mm -hmm. they get eaten up. And, and virtually every state in this country has a slogan in family court. It's called the best interest of the child. And if that were the case, I wouldn't know how to write a novel if we only had to uh, worry about the best interest of the child. But it's never about the best interest of the child. It's about money, like a lot of other things. There's sure. a trillion dollar industry internationally. A trillion with a T. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's 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 an industry. This is exactly what it is. And so when you don't think about the best interest of the child, so how are you supposed to know this? How, how You know, Michael's an air traffic controller. He's not a lawyer. And yes, he's he is naive. He's an American citizen. And he figures, well, you go to court, you get your day in court. Uh, I'll tell my side. And, and of course, you know, the, the scales of justice and all of that. Yeah, they'll no. do the right thing. Yeah. No, the court continually rules in favor of someone who's committing crimes, who's, who's yeah. abducted a child. Let me take you back. I, I would like for you to read this passage because I want to hear it in your voice. Um, Michael's wife, she, she is uh, detached from the baby in the womb. Mm. And you are very much attached to the baby in the womb. And if you probably can find this passage, but sure. she was so afraid of losing the baby that she refused to speak to it. Right. And if you can, if you can find that and read that, it's so powerful to me. It sets the stage for alienation. So start with the, she was so afraid of losing the baby. And then I think right. I took it clear down to where you say, uh, Right after the lullabies. I'd sing right into the flesh until the movement abated. That's just such a beautiful piece. I would like for you to read that. Sure. It, this is a reflection on when uh, Ben was still in the womb. But while she was carrying, despite all precautions, she still got nervous whenever anyone discussed the pregnancy. More than nervous. What I thought was a superstition became a phobia and then a religion. She was so afraid of losing that baby, she refused to speak to it or even of it. I spared her needle by testing for Tay-Sachs myself, but she was hardly relieved when it came back negative. My mother and sisters wanted to throw her a shower, but the thought paralyzed her with fear. I told my family baby showers weren't a Jewish thing. When I'd stare in rapt adoration at the sonogram, she'd bite her lower lip and turn away. And so it was up to me to communicate not wisely, but too well with the pulsing, squirming, kicking life. At night, I'd rub her stomach and press my lips close. At first, I didn't know what to say. Finally, I started singing, and it became ritual. My family's been here since the potato famine that wasn't a potato famine, thanks to the British, more than five generations. Yet somehow I fell into Irish lullabies, or what I considered Irish lullabies. Tura Lura Lou, brown-eyed girl. A limb of some kind would poke at her abdomen, and I'd sing right into the flesh until the movement abated. 
Um, yes, you know, I, I wanted to chronicle a father's journey. And I think for many fathers, it doesn't begin at birth. It uh, begins at conception. And so Michael, in some ways, had a connection with Ben uh, that even Ben's mother didn't have. And she was carrying him for nine months. And uh, then later, when Ben is born, Michael says that, you know, after the umbilical cord is cut, the doctor hands the baby to Michael and he starts singing to him and the crying stops. He believes he recognizes the songs that he had been singing to him for nine months. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to chronicle a father's love. Later in the book, when the mother is moving Ben to Israel, uh, she says a child needs his mother. I have a bond with Benjamin you'll never have. It's the natural order. Hmm. <laughs> and when you put that up against this, you know, passage of her being so detached, not wanting a baby shower, not being able to look at the sonogram, I guess the big giant question is, uh, do you believe that mothers are treated differently in the courts? And I'm not sure if that's a rhetorical question, because Rick and I have struggled with that question on a few of our episodes. But one would think after reading your book that some of the story you're trying to put out there. Yes, no. And and uh, I appreciate you bringing it up because, um, as I said, I mean, I, I can't stress it enough. These things in some ways are gender blind. Uh, parental alienation can strike mothers and it can strike fathers. So I don't want to act naive and say, well, this is just, you know, we're, let's put blinders on and pretend that this is just all gender neutral. But I, I happen to be very close in the relationship with a woman who, in fact, has also experienced alienation. So we can speak to this directly. We both, you know, we talk about the yin and yang of this and the sort of mirror images, right? Um, but having said that, now we're talking about the court system. And now we start getting into a whole nother realm because there's a scene in the novel, which is based on a true incident, I'll, I'll point out, in which the judge is speaking to Michael's attorney and says, let me be very clear, counselor, in my courtroom, the mother always gets custody unless she's on crack or a prostitute, right? So um, is that common? It's hard to say. I mean, we know the statistics. Statistically, if you have a heterosexual couple in a custody battle, statistically, mothers get custody much more often than, than fathers. Um, to just say that as a, as a blanket statement, undercuts, you know, not decades, but centuries of tradition and uh, mothers staying at home and fathers being in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But times have changed, right? I'm not the father my father was. I, I can say that in all caps and underline it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know too many dads under the age of, of 40 or 50 who are not totally immersed in their children's lives and would place fatherhood above anything else in their life. Those days, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't still exist, but, you know, most of the dads I know and, and my nephews and my nephews-in-law, they're devoted to their children. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea that advertising, TV commercials, sitcoms, they still portray fathers like it's 1958 and they're clueless and they're idiots and the kids and the moms are always smarter because the father is sitting on his butt watching TV and they're like, oh, dad, it's unrealistic. So there are a lot of little scenes in the novel that I think cumulatively add up. At one point, somebody says something about, you know, that's so great. You're babysitting your son. How can you babysit your own child? I'm his father. I don't babysit, you know? And then another scene, Ben just has a meltdown because he hasn't had his afternoon nap and they're at an amusement park. And Michael is carrying him to the car and he's crying hysterically. And a woman steps in and says, honey, do you know this man? She assumes that Michael is abducting him, you know? So they get that straightened out. And then she doesn't apologize for the accusation. And um, she says, well, you know, that happens all the time. And he said, okay, do you, do you ever ask women that are holding screaming babies if they're abducting him? You know, not trying to be cute here, but let's speak to the larger issues of the, the court says it's blind to gender. Well, that's not true. Rick, I know I, you're, I, I have, you need you have I, questions, uh, so go yeah, ahead. <clears throat> yes. Mike, thanks for, for being on, on, I mean, Bill, thanks for being Bill. on board. <laughs> um, so I have a question for the character and I have a question for the author. Okay. Um, so he goes through naivete, through depression and, and all, all through this whole experience. What 
does the characters at the end message to the world? Put the child first. I mean, as, as, as you know, as high minded as that sounds, you know, he just basically says, I'm going to love my son if it kills me. And I think, you know, he truly embodies. I mean, Michael is a walking embodiment of the child's best interests. Excellent. And he's not perfect. He's not a perfect father. He's, you know, I deal with, you know, him struggling with anger. And, you know, he, he his father was abusive. And he, um, his, his proudest accomplishment is breaking the cycle of violence, you know. Um, I defy anyone who's parented a toddler to not say at some point, you don't want to raise your hand, right? Right. Uh, if you say that, then you're- I'm living, going to kill you. you know, right. You yeah. know, maybe Mr. Rogers, but he, right. was yeah. Yeah. Rogers, so he wasn't human. He was superhuman. <laughs> but the rest of us, right? And when he's at that point where he's sick and he's he's run down and a three-year-old is doing the things that only a three-year-old can do to drive you crazy and his hand goes back, um, his father would have put him through a wall. He you know, he chooses not to. Um, that's his proudest victory. Okay. That's Michael's proudest victory. And I don't say that in an offhand way. I don't mean that as a, as a, you know, a throwaway line. He means it literally. That is his proudest moment to break that cycle. So for Michael, it's all about his child. And then the rest of his life, he's trying to live a good life like everybody else and find joy and everything else, but it's cobbled together. And part of him walks around every day knowing that, it's not as good as it could have been, but it's the best that he can make it. And it'll never be perfect. Even the term custody battle, at times I have a problem with that in itself. Because when you use the term battle, then you're implying that like any competition, there's a winner and a loser. And it's like, well, this shouldn't be a winner or a loser between two parents, right? This should be the child wins. Um, you know, th this is a tough thing to say because people don't want to hear it. And I, I, I hear my own voice and I hear I'm on a high horse saying this, but you need to put the, the interests of the child first. And if you do that, then everything else falls in place, okay? And if you hate each other's guts, okay, you hate each other's guts. But what is best for the child? And if you put your career first, if you put your bank book first, if you put your libido first, if you put any of those things first, then you're not thinking about the best interest of the child. I know that sounds very pompous to say, like, oh, that's easy to say, you know, give up your career. Well, when you bring a child into the world, I believe things change. It's a whole different realm. And are you thinking about the best interest of the child? And from a professional perspective, I can say that you see that and you know that one parent is not thinking of the best interest of the child. And you also know you can't fix it yes, because they are who they are. So then it's on the professional and the courts to determine it, regardless of whether the parents are going to figure that out or not. Right. We did the case from hell in season two, and then I yes. I finally went into the courtroom with Sarah, and that was our opening episode to this month. And what I saw was just a beep show. I don't know how else to say that, Rick. You're gonna have to put that. <laughs> You're gonna have to bleep me on that, but I don't have any. It's a very good... term my friend uses for her situation. Guess, yeah. <laughs> But in determining the best interest, and in fact, one of the things that Sarah's therapist said to the custody evaluator in an email is that this woman is getting treated worse than the average child abuser, because had she actually abused her child and Child Protective Services would have acknowledged that she was an abusive parent, they would have had her sign a safety plan she would have been probably under the care of Child Protective Services for a few months. She would have passed some classes. She would have been closely watched. And then she would have been reunited with her children. Right. But because her co-parent had money to keep this case lingering and continued for so many years, and because the custody evaluator just did not do his job. And because the courts kept changing judges on her to the new judge had to catch up and four years went by only for a judge to tell her, you did not abuse your children. This should have never happened to you. Right. So sorry, but you can't have them now. How is it that the best interest according to Child Protective Services is that that child needs to be reunited with that parent as soon as possible because we know that's good for children. Right. 
but money allows you to pay a lot of people to try to figure out the best interests of the children. And they don't. Right. It's <laughs> right. the unfairness. So, so when you talk about best interest standard in the court system, it's kind of a joke. Yes, it is. And I'm talking from a professional perspective. Right. It, it doesn't have the meaning that it does in the real world. And I think, yeah. you know, the, the, the real follow up question to that is, but at what cost, right? What cost to the child? Sure. And that's hard sure. to measure. And what cost right. to Michael? I mean, Michael, you know, his life just collapses, right? I mean, right. his work suffers, his career suffers. He's at one point, he's, he's virtually homeless, sleeping on his brother's sofa for a couple of months. The legal right. bills, he files for personal bankruptcy. And ultimately, it takes the toll that he becomes clinically depressed and suicidal. Um, right. That's the cost on him. And, and you know, at one point, his brother says to him, you know, you don't have an option of taking your own life because you have Ben. Yeah, um, right. If you didn't have Ben, you might very well. He said, but you can't. He speaks to so him. Even you love feel trapped in that way. Yes. <laughs> I can't right. even end I mean, my life. Yeah. I, I mean, his brother so, clearly understands if there was no child, Michael might just jump off a bridge. Right. Rick, you had another question. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Before Rick, he said he had two questions. He got one. And we, then yeah. We yeah this one's this one's for the author. Okay. I'll get is, him. Hold on. He's right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is Michael a character of hope? Oh, what a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. I think so. Yeah, I think ultimately, I don't think he would have survived otherwise. Um, but boy, does that does that light, you know, burn very dimly for a while there. Um, but it never goes out. And again, I mean, I know this may sound um, corny to some people, but it, it's he has a lot of people in his life that he loves and love him. But it's Ben that pulls him through that scene where he says to his brother, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to make it. And his brother says, you know, it's not an option. You have Ben. Yeah. You know, no and and his brother inst intuitively knows this is the nerve to get through to Michael. Well, in in a world, in, a, in an issue that is incredibly painful, um, thanks for writing a book on hope. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it uh, it didn't start out that way, but ultimately it is. Yeah, and I yeah. think... You know, I think it's no less than our responsibility. You bring a child into the world and you're going to do everything you can to make sure that he or she has the best possible path, right? That's just, it's all you can do. And nobody's perfect and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But it just, I don't I don't think parenting should just be stacked alongside a lot of other things. Like, oh, I'm a good tennis player and I'm a good this and I'm a good <laughs> that and I'm a good parent. No, parenting is another realm. Right. And I, don't, right. I, I know that people who aren't parents sometimes roll their eyes and say like, oh, you're always talking about your kids. I get that. And I and I also know many wonderful people who aren't parents, but are wonderful with children and are great aunts and uncles and yeah. things like that. And they have a role too in all of this. But I just think once you make that commitment, you bring a child into the world, then you have to look at your career differently. You have to look at your love life differently, all of it. To say, well, sure. wait, is this the best choice for the kid or kids? So I'm curious how, after you've talked to so many alienated parents, how do you process this with them? And what is it they're really trying to accomplish so that I can be part of the solution and not the problem? Well, it's a great question. First of all, I do have to just acknowledge the work that both of you are doing. And it's just beyond words to, to put, you know, to express how great it is that you're helping so many people. And and you mentioned, you know, it's also money. It's also time, right? This is so yeah. time consuming. And that's, again, why I wrote this in first person. You're in Michael's life. He has to get up in the morning. He has to go to work. Not for nothing. It's not a job you can sleep through. He's talking to airplanes and it's life and death, right? And at one point he's in school and he's running to classes and he's running to the courts and he's running to speak to psychologists and he, yeah. he doesn't have enough gas in his car and he has $3 in his wallet and his ATM is tapped out. And then now layer on that, what if you're in a relationship and what if you have other kids and what if you have stepkids and what if, you know, and now people start getting very frustrated, right? And that's what I hear from, from alienated parents all the time too. This is a war of attrition in many ways. And it's not just about money. It's about who's going to stick it out, right? And we're talking about children. That's the thing here. This isn't a war of attrition over the summer house or the, the second car, right? This is a war of attrition over a child. And 
there's a passage where Michael speaks very passionately about it's the one time he breaks the first person and goes into second person. And he says, we see you out there. He's more or less speaking to the reader. He says, we see you out there. We know the telling glances. We know the eye roll, you know, where people say, oh, you're still fighting. Oh, it's not. It's been all these years. Can't you sit down and work it out? Right. Um, again, <laughs> trying to work yeah. things out with a narcissist. Go try it. See how easy it is. But he says, this is like when a child disappears and you never give up or when a soldier in combat is missing in action or when someone has a debilitating disease that's long term, you know, at first everyone gathers around and offers support. And then after a while, they go back to their lives and it's like, oh, you're still doing that. Oh, you're still, wait, you're still fighting. And Michael also makes the observation that the very same people contradict themselves at some point, you know, close friends, these are people on his side, mind you, that will say to him, you can't let her get away with that. Get to court. Get tell the judge. Blah blah blah. And then six months later, I'll say, "Oh, you're still fighting with her. Can't you? you know, <laughs> right. can't, can't you just bury it? You know? Yeah. Well, which is it? And so when well, the, what they're saying is, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, come get on. off the fence. Either go yeah, fight I mean, it or get on with your life. Right. Are we talking about the Mets now. You know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. that's another depressing topic. But yes. Um, <laughs> so you know. The, I, I, I hear this all the time, that, and that's the demographic of one thing. And, and, and again, I want to stress, Michael has a wonderful support system. He has family and friends that are there for him. But ultimately, nobody is walking in your shoes. And so when you talk about these things, it's, you know, if somebody, at one point early on, he says, if somebody told me now what I don't know, I might just jump off that bridge, right? You know, you're you're in and you yeah. stay in and you stay on this course. But if somebody were to say, by the way, you're about to have 18 years of utter hell, or you're about to spend the rest of your life never fully recovering, you know, as right. many of us don't recover from many wounds, from deaths and other right. things where, yes, you move on. Yes, you quote unquote heal, but you don't. It's always there. And you you, yeah. you live it every day. And yeah. so I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, but I think... You hit a nerve when you brought it up, because I think it's such a key issue to say, you know, people don't always understand this. This is not just go away. One of the things you said, and I don't remember where it was in the book, but I wrote it down. You said, what I don't know and we would be shocked to learn is that the bile will go away, but it will leave a mark. Despite what the professionals in the books all repeat as a mantra, the bile is a poison that I have to live with for the rest of my years. Betrayal has an infinite shelf life, and like a cockroach, it can survive an apocalypse. I mean, I <laughs> there's no way to that section. not get yeah, next time I do a reading. I haven't read that one in a while. <laughs> yeah, that, that, the imagery there, the cockroach, which yeah. I hate. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Diane and I are very excited about our Right to Peace Foundation and the program to keep court professionals accountable. If you would like to get involved and help us. Click on the survey link in the show notes below. Um, yeah. So, you know, in, at the end of the day here, if it were about the children, much of this would not, we wouldn't be talking about it, but right. it's not. So, I mean, we have to acknowledge the first things first. Like a lot of things, this is an industry, it's about money. So we start there and then we say, okay, well, then how do we get money out of it so that Okay, everybody's going to get paid, the lawyers and the consultants that are that are brought in and the forensic psychologists and everything. Okay, fine. They all have a job to do. I understand that. But at what point are they doing more harm than good? At what point are they not thinking about the child? If you put the child first, then the chips fall where they may. That's that's my philosophy. Well, we we can't change how people think, obviously. So I've been doing that for 20 years, trying to educate, educate, educate. And then after Sarah's case, I became more passionate about keeping people accountable. So Rick right. and I are starting a spinoff podcast called It's Criminal, where we're going to highlight cases that aren't criminal, but should be, and talk about these kinds of cases that how can that be allowed to be happening and someone's not going to jail for it? Right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, I, I and as a, thank you. Yes. And yes. As a companion to that, I've started a nonprofit called the Right to Peace Foundation, which is going to raise money to actually put observers in courtrooms to hold mm -hmm. people accountable. Because one of the things I discovered when I went 
into Sarah's case is when I sat down in that courtroom, because it was a courtroom I was familiar with, the judge knew me and both attorneys knew me. When I sat down, they, it changed them. <laughs> they were like, hmm. why are you here? Right. Just watch. Right. It's America. But it's a just, courtroom. It's open court. Exactly. But because I'm a professional in right. the industry, in this area, and, you know, the judge walks in, sets down, because, oh, Miss Dirks is here. Are you testifying today? I'm like, nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Rick and I talked about this and whether or not that had an effect because this judge ended up doing some amazing things in that courtroom that I'd never seen before. And I, mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. to think, is she grandstanding for me? Oh, boy. What a fantastic idea. Boy. I and mean, the then idea even that the there attorneys. Would be a Diane in every court. How great would that one be? One of the attorneys tried to get me removed from the courtroom. And what grounds? Because. He was afraid they were secretly going to get me to testify because he knew I was familiar with the defendant. Right. So he wanted to invoke the um, sequestering rule. He wanted the, the judge to proclaim that I would not testify because otherwise he wanted the judge to remove me from the courtroom in case there was any chance. And I had to stand. What citizen has to stand up in the courtroom and, and declare under oath that I will not testify wow. just because I decided to go sit down. So mm -hmm. I don't know where this is going to go. And it's kind of my retirement project. Well, I'm pledging the... support. If I can help in any way okay. to spread the word, anything I can okay. do. But, but you did you, say, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, Dan. I just want to say one thing that you said really resonated with me. And that is, you know, the criminal aspect of this, because we throw words around like criminal. Well, this is to me, if you're going to destroy a child, then that's as criminal as it can get. Right. And yeah. I have a friend who said to me one time, she said she was speaking about an extreme case of alienation with her husband that was all psychological. And she yeah. said, you know, I just wish he had punched me in the face and given me a black eye and given me some stitches and given me a broken arm. Because then, then the system knows what to do. Then you dial 911, right. two mm -hmm. cops will come, put handcuffs on him, drag him out, he'll be in jail. Yeah. And then it's like, now the system is like, oh, now we're in comfort here. There's comfort zone, right. right? Now, oh, we know what to do with this guy now, right? And, and we're off and running. You can't call yeah. 911 to say, um, for the third time, I spoke to my child's pediatrician and they wouldn't give me the records on the, on the recent, no. visit, you know, right. you know, you're going to send two cops to the door to oh, say, Oh, that's a civil issue. Go take right, that to right, court. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I was supposed to pick up my child at the shopping center at 7 PM on Friday night and they weren't there. No call, no text. Um, I'm going to call 911, you know, what, what, yeah. are, what are the cops going to do? Right. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so that is, you know, we need to start looking at it in those terms, because uh, yeah. I think, you know, the word criminal is used too narrow in some ways. I mean, right. some of this behavior certainly right. should be criminal. Right. Some of the professionals are committing crimes, in my idea. No but uh, the podcast industry, the number one genre is true crime. Mm -hmm. So when we finally put this podcast out there, I'm going to term it a true crime podcast. Excellent. Excellent. And Great. Even though it's not going to have the elements of murder. Right. <laughs> it, right. In my mind, it's true crime. And I Absolutely. hope we get a lot of true crime listeners who go, oh, oh, well, this is different. Oh, is that really happening? And get some people angry about it because if professionals aren't willing to be educated. We're going to start watching them. Yes. So it, one it of the is. best things you could do for me, Bill, is... When we do start promoting the new podcast and the nonprofit, for you to maybe um, promote that on the sites that you're on, absolutely, because absolutely. you're probably known well, more well known than Rick and I are. So, right. no, I'd be happy to spread the yeah. word and and with the Parental Alienation Study Group, which is probably the most respected organization in the world on these issues, and yeah. you know they have scholars that have done groundbreaking work on this. I'd be happy to spread the word far and wide. Okay. Um, it just, it, it, what a great idea. I mean, to, you know, to have, bring some accountability into this. And again, you know, we're back to, I mean, it was funny when that was sort of funny, haha, where the woman who was the, the legal professional texted me and said, oh no, you, you're, you're making all these mistakes in this book. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. what we're talking about here. This is a yeah. big open jaw thing, this court system. And we just, you know, it eats up people, children, yeah. adults. And, you can. know, who's supposed to know these things ahead of time? The yeah. an air traffic controller. What does he know about ad litem? I mean, give me a break. Well, Bill, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today to 
do this, put yourself out um, there and, and open marvelous. up this yeah. topic really is, uh, you know, courageous, it's bold, it's enlightening, it's but then vulnerable, you know, all of those things. So we the real it. reward is, is when you hear from people and they say, wow, I also feel like a demographic of one, you know, and I get that. Yeah. And that is the greatest of all. It's nice when people say, oh, I like the book and the way it was written and this and that. But when people say, you know, it spoke to me and I feel oh. just like Michael at times, when that happens, that's a million dollars for me. You know, yeah. it just all the risk you took seems to make be worth it then. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All but right. Well, how again, do we I get want to your thank book? Both of you for, for doing all that you do. Um, Thank you. How do you get half the child? Well, the good news is uh, if you want print, you can get print. If you want ebook or Kindle, you can do that. And it's also an audio book. And okay. I'm so happy. Uh, last year it became an audio book. And the guy that did it, he's a wonderful uh, speech teacher, but he's also from Queens, New York, as I am and as Michael is. So he's got a nice good okay. Queens accent like mine. Oh, good. He does the <laughs> so reading. it sounds um, believable. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah. depending on how you want to buy it, it's on a bunch of different venues. But the best way is to go to halfthechild.com. No okay, punctuation great. or anything. Halfthechild.com. And then there are links there to how you can purchase. Okay. And we will put all of that in the show it. notes. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, what you're doing is great. And I look forward to coming back again and talking to you again. All right. Yes. Thank you. We'll talk to everybody next week. All right. Bye-bye everybody. Bye. Hey listeners. We finally digitized our first workshop on how to use the communication protocol and we're selling it on our Patreon page. Of course, listeners who signed up as a Patreon VIP prior to releasing it got it for free, among other perks. So that's a great reason to become a VIP so you can have many gifts bestowed upon you. If you missed this workshop last year and want to get all of the information on how to execute it, it's now available at patreon.com slash cpdilemmas. Download it today to start your journey toward co-parent sanity. The information contained in this podcast is generic. It must not be misconstrued as constituting legal or psychological advice. Decisions relevant to any specific individual, family system, or case require the direct evaluation of skilled, child-centered professionals.